So we are right in the middle of a series uh, this morning. I want to encourage you to get your tablets and your phones and your notes and your pencils and your your choose your own ink uh, uh, pens if you have one of those. You know that you can touch. Remember those? Okay. Um, we are in this series about not doing life alone. How many of you are glad we don't have to do life alone? I don't know about you. I'm glad about that. Um, and I have something that. Um, you know, when, when, when I, I, I really have been praying about this message uh, for a while now, and, and I've had this, this burden on my heart for this topic of not doing life alone. You know, the more that I realize about our culture specifically in our society is that we are more connected as human beings than we've ever been before in the history of mankind. But we are the most isolated that we've ever been in the history of mankind. We are more connected than ever before we can see, we can trace likability, we can trace how social you are, we can trace where you are, we can see what you're eating because you feel like you need to display it for the whole world uh, every day. I had olives tonight, look at this beautiful salad, you know, like, and, and you can see things about one another, but we're less connected than ever before. We're more connected, but more protected than ever before. And what I love about the kingdom of God and what we are as a church is that we weren't actually created to do life alone. We were created to do life together. And one of the hardest parts about living life with people is people. <laughs> and what I wanna talk about this morning, because I believe that everybody qualifies, and it's something that I wish I had probably 16 weeks to talk about, uh, is specifically the topic of relationships pertaining to marriage. And I want to talk about families and marriage this morning. And it doesn't matter if you're young. Like, if you're, if you're eight years old, I got something for you too, so hold on. And maybe I'll give you some candy afterwards. Uh, if you're 88 years old, that's great. If you're married, that's great. If you're married nine times, that's great. If you're divorced, that's great. If you're single, that's great. I'm not saying that's great. You're like, wow, he's really going through my hardship. You know, I'm not saying that's great. What I'm saying is I got something for everybody, okay? So hold on. Are you good? Yeah. We might need to pray again, okay, after this setup. But we're going to talk about the institution of marriage this morning because I believe it has so many implications to the life we are called to live specifically with our relationship with God. Whether we know it or not, God thinks in terms of family. If you look at scripture from Genesis to Revelation, God speaks in family, thinks in family. All throughout scripture, we're called the family of God. He refers to history when he talks about families and lineage. I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. He goes, God is a God of family. And so if we, I want to talk about this broad relationship that we have in this family of God this morning, because I believe if we can understand how significant the family of God is to God, it will of course affect our marriage relationships, it will affect, in fact, affect rather the way we see our spouse, but it will affect the way that we see God if we do it right, Okay. In Revelations chapter 2, Jesus is talking to the church in Ephesus. And for those of you who know Bible history, and if you don't, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fill you in a little bit. In Ephesians, the, there's this book called Ephesians in the New Testament. And it's basically a letter from the Apostle Paul to the church in Ephesus. And if you know history about Ephesus, you know that the Ephesians, the church in Ephesus was actually God's the, the, really the perfect church in a lot of ways. The church in Ephesus was the ideal church, when, and when Paul wrote to them, he said, you guys have basically got it all figured out. You guys are the shining example. He was so proud of them when Paul was writing to the church in Ephesus. He was saying, man, you guys, are, you guys got it. The whole church, the Christians from around the world should replicate and, 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 and be a reflection of what's taking place in here in Ephesus, which is an awesome thing. So if we can learn anything, wow, Gabe, note to self. Side note, I should read Ephesians later. It's a great book. You should read it. But Jesus in Revelations 
is talking about specifically the church in Ephesus because time had passed and something had taken place between what Paul once said about Ephesus, the church in Ephesus, and where they were now. And Jesus says in Revelations chapter 2, verse 2, he says, I, I know all the things that you do. I've seen your hard work, your patient endurance. I know um, that you don't tolerate evil people. You've examined the claims of those who say they are apostles but are not. You've discovered that they are liars. You've, you've, you've patiently suffered for me without quitting. He's encouraging them. But then he says this in verse 4. But I, Jesus, again, red letter, I, Jesus, have this complaint against you. You don't love me or each other as you did at first. Look how far, he says, you've fallen. In other, in other words, at one point you had it. At one point the love, the affection for me and one another was there. But you don't have the love and affection that you once did. And then he says this. Look how far you've fallen. He says, turn back to me and what? Do the works. Look at your neighbor this morning and say, but don't look at your spouse. Look at the other neighbor, okay? And say, do the works. Now look at your spouse if they're here and say, I'll, I'll do the works. <laughs> do the works you did at first. At first. Remember when you first met your spouse, if you're married right now? <laughs> Do you remember how hard you used to work for that affection before you received their affection? Now, for me, this is the reverse. I'm just, if I'm just being honest, my wife's not here. I can say that she told me she loved me three times before I said I loved her. <laughs> She's laughing in the back. She actually, actually is here. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> Which is weird because if you know me, you know that that's not really me. I tell everybody I love them. But, you know, I was like super cool, you know, and I couldn't show her even though I'm like, yeah, I'm winning. <laughs> <laughs> Do the works you once did at first. You know, I think about, my wife really tricked me into liking her because she worked. <laughs> she, amen, somebody. Is that Aaron? I love you, man. She used to fake things that she liked to get me to like her that were important to me and come to find out she hates those things. <laughs> I used to love, I, I used to, right, because I've been married for 10 years this year. I used to love to play tennis. She was like, hey, let's go on tennis dates. Let's get all our friends to play tennis. I haven't played tennis with my wife since we were dating. <laughs> and one, one day, <laughs> this is so not her, my wife's like a cat. She never, I never play, I didn't plan on saying in this, honey, I'm sorry. My wife's like a cat. She never likes to get wet. One day, she jumped in a lake fully clothed with me just to be like, hey, let's like, let's just frolic around and jump in a lake. She just tricked me, okay? And <laughs> now that we're married, you know, now she's like kicking me in the night, you know, like don't touch me in the night, you know? <laughs> this morning, how, how, how far should I go? <laughs> This morning, yeah, right, it's a wise man once said, I've taken the filter off, but we're family here. This morning, she start. <laughs> we get into our little, you know, we don't really fight, we just kind of, you know, you know, you just kind of go at it a little bit, you know, you know what I'm talking about, yeah, yeah, intense fellowship, he pastor said. <laughs> I go, babe, what are we doing? And she's like, what are you going to do about the trees in front of the house? And I was like. I don't know, babe. I just got back. I was in prayer this morning. What do you want to do with the trees in front of the house? Wait a minute. And we got into this fight about the trees. And I'm like, can you just pump the brakes on this conversation? I'm actually going to church this morning to talk about you. And I would like to have positive thoughts about you before I go to church. <laughs> and And that is life. Uh, <laughs> But I love my wife, and um, man, I'm, I am, <laughs> yeah, right, you say that now. Uh, you know, I, I, when I think, I'm more excited. I told Pastor this, we were texting and talking last weekend. I feel like I have more of an authority to talk on marriage more than ever before uh, because, um, because we've been tested. 
And, you know, every relationship and everything that God does, you know, our, our pastor in, in California um, last weekend, he said, every single time God gives you a dream, hell sends you a nightmare. And he said, the reason that you walk through a hard time is because God wants you to know when you're in the middle of a storm that he's put you and he's allowed you, I should say, he, not put you, but he's allowed you to walk through a storm because you're worthy of what's on the other side. And so I feel like there's an authority on my, on my life to speak about marriage more than ever before because we fought through adversity. We fought at the mountaintop, but we've also fought at the lowest valleys, and we've said, come hell or high water, I would rather die than break what this is. And, and that is, you know, because there's been times, you know, there, there, I, I think when I, when I read this verse and, and what, what Jesus is saying is he's saying, listen, you guys are the shining example, Ephesus. You know, what we also use from Ephesians, again, to, you know, we talk about, look at, look at the book of Ephesians. In Ephesians chapter five, it's like the most famous passage of scripture that everybody talks about at a wedding. Remember? When Paul says, hey, hey, just so you know, women, he says to the women, submit to your, to your husbands. And then he says to the husbands, you're going to have to die to your wife as, as I died to the church. And he says, make no mistake, I'm talking about the church, but this analogy cannot coexist. They, they coexist together. The, the relationship between a man and a woman in a marriage is, is, is so, has so many parallels to God and us. And there have been times in my life where we've gone through and we've fought through things, but our ability to fight through things and, and, and to honor what it is, the institution that we have, has literally made my life and our marriage so much greater. Our children are, are, are doing well so I, and, 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 and beautiful, and, and, and they respect my wife. And, and I wanted to take us through a couple of things that I think are foundational to relationship, marriage, and really our relationship with God. Because at the end of the day, your marriage will always be in a reflection of your relationship with God. And really every relationship you have, but specifically your marriage, because again, that should be the top priority. Your relationships... Your marriage will be a reflection of your relationship with God. It is impossible to have a great relationship with Jesus and not have a great relationship with your spouse. It's not possible. Does it mean there aren't issues? Absolutely not. Does it mean that there aren't things to overcome? Absolutely not. Does it mean that there aren't temptation? Absolutely not. Does it mean that you don't make mistakes? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And so I wanted to talk through a couple of things because... At the end of the day, what I've realized about my marriage more than anything else is that God wants us, desires that we are one. God desires that we are one together because why? There is so much supernatural power in our agreement. When two or three, but when two are, are together in agreement, we see supernatural things take place that are so much greater than any person alone. And I want to, I know that this is a touchy subject. I know that there are people who have been in broken relationships. I know that there are people who have had their hearts broken. But I want to, here's the deal. If we don't allow ourselves to get over our past, we'll never go into the future. And I came to tell somebody this morning that you've been rereading the last chapters of your life and you can't ever get into the next chapter of your life if you keep reading the ones that are the past. And so no matter where you are this morning, we are all a work in progress. In fact, that was my wife's answer to me. I'm talking about you this morning. Well, just tell them you're a work in progress, she said. <laughs> If God's allowed you to go through a storm, it's because you're worthy of what's on the other side. And I wanna tell you about a couple of things that I believe are the, key, are the key priorities to our relationship with our spouse, with others, and ultimately with God, first and foremost. For those of us taking notes this morning, I believe that these are the things that will help us win in life. These are the things that will determine if our lives are good or extraordinary. The first one 
is to prioritize. It sounds easy, it sounds basic, but the, the challenges of life, we need to be prioritizing our, our spouses. We need to, I need to prioritize my wife. I need to her to know that she's number one, that what she says and what's coming out of her mouth is the most important thing that I'm hearing audibly in this earth. The only thing that trumps my wife is God. The only thing. But here's the thing that I've realized in priorities. As the demands of life increase, so does the temptation to isolate and not communicate. If God's desire for our relationships and for my marriage, I don't know about yours, but for mine, is for us to be one, that means I have to work harder when the demands of life are harder and they increase, okay? That means I'm wise about how my, if I'm just being honest, in the last probably four years, things that we were going through, things that we were believing God for became easier for me, the temptation and what I did in certain seasons, in the last several years, probably the last five years, it was easier for me to make decisions without my wife than it was to make them with her. And I'm not alone on that. As you go through things, as things of life, as life hits you, as things are coming at you fast, sitting down and processing slowly with other people isn't awesome. Okay, I'm like a microwave. My wife is like a slow burning, wet wood stove, okay? So you can tell me something, and I'm like, boom, I'm there. My wife's like, let's talk about it for the next three months, you know? <laughs> and that was tough, you know? Like, I'm, I'm extremely type A, you know? And, and so, and she's type A too, but she's slow to process. So she's like type A, so her first response is, no. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Baby, I bought a car, you know? How many, how many wipes some, I, I got a dog, you know? Like, here's what we do. When we're processing things, we process them slowly. For me, we have a very, my wife and I, uh, we have a very intense schedule in terms of, like, traveling and that type of thing. And what I've realized is I say yes to a lot of invitations and a lot of trips and a lot of things. And I used to just save them all in my pocket. I would have this little task of things that I need, this is like me just, this is my dirty laundry bag, okay? I'm just gonna pull out some things, okay? Uh, so what I used to do, and I don't do this anymore, okay? Because I've learned the hard way. What I used to do is have the things that I needed to review with my wife in my pocket and wait for the most ideal opportunity to bring them up. Hey, babe, I love you. This is so amazing. You spend so much time with the family. By the way, thank you for saying that, love. I just got invited to go to Australia for 15 days. When is it? It's next week. <laughs> you said you were taking Beckham, our son, to get his first shots at the doctor. I know I said that, but you're gonna have to do it, you know? That just doesn't go well, okay? So, so the opportunity to prior, know what we, you know what we do now? We sit down and plan our calendars a year in advance with worship music on, sitting together, <laughs> and our kids are not in the house, okay? I'm not kidding. We sit down, we pull out an iPad, we agree, we add each other to calendar appointments with intense worship music on. <laughs> and it's beautiful, okay? Priorities, prioritize. Listen, here's the deal. Your marriage is only gonna work in first place. If your marriage isn't first place in your life, it will not work. It's, it's, it honestly, so many parallels to your relationship with God. If God, your relationship with God is not in first place, you know God actually in the Bible calls himself jealous? And you know that your wives, husband, have a lot of the same characteristics and tendencies of God? Did you know that? Some women are like, amen, and the men are like, unfortunately, yeah. <laughs> Marriage will only work when it's in first place. No other thing in life, and here's the deal. When you stand before God and make a covenant before God that your marriage will be in first place and you put other things in first place in front of your marriage, guess what? The things you put in front of your marriage also don't work because you're not who you need to be. Very quiet up in here. If you don't believe me, Exodus 34, 14. God is saying, you must worship no other gods for the Lord, whose very name 
is jealous, is a God who is jealous about his relationship with you. What does that mean? It means that our great God is intolerant of rivalry. And our relationship with our wives, husbands, and, 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 and ladies and wives with your husbands should be the number one priority in your life. But we have to prioritize. Your kids will get in the way. Your kids will try to jump in front. Your kids, your kids, they're bleeding. <laughs> my daughter got a big bloody eye yesterday too. My wife used to say, my, our kids only get hurt when you watch them, but now I got evidence. <clears throat> <laughs> I told my wife, I came home from Lima yesterday, I said, babe, we can't take her out. Like Child Protective Services are going to arrest you and I'm not taking this one. <laughs> like, her eye, I mean, anyways, I'm not gonna show you the picture, it makes me cringe. Studies do show that as life increases, the satisfaction of marriage actually does scientifically decrease. So we need to be very careful to prioritize our spouses. As kids, demands, sports, all of it, as they, as they come running in, of all of those things, the satisfaction of your marriage will decrease. So what does that mean? We have to forcefully make sure that our marriages are number one. That we're one. That we're one. The second thing, first is priorities. The second thing is that we have to protect our relationships and our marriage against the good things. Because how many of you know our kids are a good thing? We need to be able to filter out the good things from the things that are God's number one thing. We need to filter the good. Are your friends a bad thing? No. Is your job a good thing? Is your extended family a good thing? Of course. But if you're not listening to your spouse, if you're not hearing their hearts and communicating, then you'll miss it. Are you with me? Your spouse must be your first priority. The third thing is this, that we need to have some realistic expectations of love. I think in the world we live in, the society that we live in, the culture we live in, we have very unrealistic expectations of what love is. Love is a feeling that can come and go. Love has never been a feeling that you just get. You don't just fall in love. You don't just trip, hit your head and fall in love. That doesn't happen. You don't fall into it because if you fell into it, then you can fall out of it. Love is something that will cost you your life. If Jesus himself loved us and died for us, Ephesians chapter five said, then we too need to realize that love is a sacrifice. And guess what? Sacrifices aren't sacrifices unless they actually cost you something. And yesterday's sacrifice can come, become today's routine. So just because, and here's what we do as men. This is, I wish I lightened up. Again, I feel like I grit heavy again. Us men, we operate our relationships with our wives and when we're dating and when we're married on like this points-based system. You know what I'm talking about, men? But the problem with the point-based system is that all points expire at midnight, Okay? So you can do something wonderful for your wife, but that, like, you get your wife some jewelry, that lasts like a couple days, okay? But us men, we think, I got you that. I took you on that trip. I, at midnight, just when you wake up the next day, all bets are off, okay? I take my wife on a vacation the next morning at 6 a.m. She's nudging me, go get the kids. Get out of bed. Babe, I just did all these things for you. I let you sleep in. What? That's all over. <laughs> I used to think I was earning points by dropping things off for my wife and getting her fl the flowers and all those things are great. But if you're doing, if you're trying to appreciate your significant other through a points-based system, you've missed it. You've missed it. Everything expires at midnight. At midnight, our relationships with our spouses are a lot like our relationship with God. We can't just turn them on and turn them off. 
We can't just go and, and push hard in this season and then, you know, not in this season. If I'm not praying every day, then my relationship with God will change. It's just the way of life. If I come to church two times a year, or if I come to church one month and then take three months off, I need to be around people who love Jesus more than I do. And it's not enough for me just to hear it or to put on a radio station or to put it on in the car. I need to be around people who are challenging me to be a better person, to be a better dad, to be a better husband, to be a better friend, to be a better person. It's the same thing with our marriage relationships. We need to turn it on every day. It's not a point-based system. It's how am I going to really love this person? And the world has stolen the true definition of love. Love is based on a feeling. Love is based on whatever we want it to be. Love is based on convenience. It's based on how, we cater, how it caters to us, how it makes us feel. And so if we run our lives based on how we feel, I'm really glad I don't run my life on how I feel. Because there are a lot of challenges and storms and rough waters and opposition. It's the law of motion. If you want to do anything with your life of significance, you're going to get opposition. And if I took my temperature or ran a pulse check in the midst of opposition, and I said, well, you know, I feel opposition. That means I'm, I've, I've missed it, or this is not right. Then I could quit everything in my life. I'm glad Jesus didn't give up on, on me based on a feeling. Like, these nails hurt in my hand. This crown of thorns, it, it hurts a little. It's getting really heavy again, sorry. <laughs> but the third thing is that we need to maintain this realistic expectation of love and know that love is gonna cost us something. And when we sacrifice, we have to renew our sacrifice with, again, more sacrificing. And when you do it, guess what? It becomes more natural. When you love sacrificially, it, it doesn't feel the way it always feels when you start doing it at first, right? Because when you start to sacrifice at first, you're like, ooh, that hurts. But then when you actually become comfortable with uncomfortable, it actually gets easier. Wouldn't it be amazing if we just became comfortable at being uncomfortable? When anything comes at us, we can just deflect and say, you know what, I hear you. I'm listening, and what you're saying is important to me. What's coming out of your mouth is important to me. Maintain a realistic expectation of your love. The fourth one, and the final one, is to surrender and live a life of surrender, a surrendered lifestyle. This activates, when we surrender to our spouse, when we sur uh, surrender to our relationships, we surrender to God, it activates a supernatural strength within us. My wife and I, we share everything. What's, what's hers is, is mine, and what's mine is hers. And what I've realized is that marriage is brutal to selfish people. Relationships in general are brutal to selfish people. When we surrender and die to ourselves, there's something so supernatural that takes place. And what I think we do a lot is, because I, I used to do this, and I, I have friends that I, I challenge, my, my best friends were constantly challenging each other in this area, is not to look at the past in a way that is evidence for how you can act now. You know, if we look back at our life, there's tons of excuses for us to maintain really any position. There's a lot of people that have gone through a storm, and if you say, man, what's, ro what's wrong? And they're like, I'm beat up. And you're like, well, yeah, you, you have the right to feel beat up. You've been through a storm. But then there are those who walk through a storm, and you say, you know what? I've realized that I walked through the storm because God qu is qualifying me and allowing me to step into something great. And as a result, I'm going to have this view on and with my wife, no matter what we've been through, no matter if there's been hardship, no matter if there's been a loss of trust, no matter if there's been um, words that, man, we gotta watch our words, by the way, but, 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 but we speak life. We declare victory. 
Your words are creating worlds in your marriage. So when you say you're this or you're that or you're always this and you're always that and you never this and you never that, you are, you are painting death over your relationship. Marriage is brutal to selfish people. We need to be selfless people, selfless people. And so what we did is really, you know, specifically, the last year for us has been the greatest year that, that, that I've been alive and that I've been married for sure. I mean, and that, that's, I guess that's the way I always want it to be. I always want the year we're in to be the best year, even though it's not void of hardship and trial and all of that. Um, but what I've realized is that when you come together as a couple and you begin to validate and understand where what, what's important to them and what's important to them actually becomes important to you and what's important to you will then, as you show that men will be important to your wife. Men, when you look at your wife and you, say, and you stop everything, you just say, what you're saying is actually very important to me and I'm gonna do everything I can to meet you there, um, then it changes everything. And what I've realized is we just began to take the Bible and just read scripture over each other and encourage each other. I have never been, I don't think I've ever been this encouraging to my wife than I've been in the last year, and she has never been this encouraging than she is on me. She's like on hyper duty, active encouragement in my life. Does it mean we don't bicker about things? No, because we're human beings. But she just is in this driver mode, and it's, it's, it's unbelievable when we've unlocked this thing. And what, what we've done is we've just taken the Bible, and we read. We, there's lots of, lots of books that you can read, but the Bible really reads you. And as you read the Bible, it begins to highlight and illuminate and bring things to the surface in your own life. And you're doing those things together. It's a beautiful thing. Are you with me? As we close, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, try, to, I'm gonna try to draw this thing up and, 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 and wrap. But I wanted to give you a couple of, of things really quickly that, um, again, the four things that we need to be careful for in our relationship, number, number one, uh, is that we're prioritizing our spouse above all. Prioritize your marriage. It is the number one priority. Number two, to protect those priorities even from good things. Number three, to maintain realistic expectations of love, that love's gonna cost me something, that it, it requires sacrifice, and sacrifice doesn't feel good. And just because I sacrifice once doesn't mean I'm sacrificing in the future. Number four, to surrender everything. What's mine is yours. I lay down everything for you. And I wanted to give you, as we close this morning, three quick things that will destroy any relationship that I want us to be aware of. And, 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 and number one, just being very careful, criticism. Be careful, don't be a critic of your own marriage. Don't criticize your spouse. Don't give negative words. Death and life are in the power of your tongue and what you're speaking. Words can elevate and they can kill. Are you with me? Number two, control any type of dominance and get rid of any type of dominance in your relationship and roles in your relationship. You serve this process, I serve this. Obviously, we know that men and women are very different. Instinctively, and, and, and in our nature, we're different people. But no one person ever has the right to dominate over another person. It's okay to get counsel, get help. Get people that will sit down and be able to work through things with you. Your future will not live if your past doesn't die. And number three, very carefully, making sure that we're not checked out. You know, I think if we were to ask people, it's sometimes easier as life goes by just to check out, just to say, you know what? I've tried. I, I, I've, 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 I've. I, but I'm so glad that Jesus didn't check out on me because I deserve to be checked out on. The way that I've lived my life, I've tried to do what I know to do in my relationship with God, but I've still fallen short. You know why? Because I'm a human. <laughs> We're all there. But we don't ever get the right to check out on our greatest, most important relationship. You don't have the right to check out. And it's a defense mechanism. People put up walls. My prayer for us this morning, 
really is that we would be one, that we would knock down the walls. That we wouldn't have this criticism, that we wouldn't have these dominant relationships over one another, that we wouldn't have these walls that are there and, and, and check out on one another. Because we lose and our spouse loses. At the very beginning, God gave us this commandment to Adam and Eve. He gave, he gave mankind a commandment. He said, be fruitful and multiply. And that multiplication is in our marriage relationship, but it's also in how we live our lives with everybody. You know, you look at the greatest mandate that Jesus ever gave us. He said, go into all the world and make disciples. In other words, multiply. See, God thinks in terms of family. From Genesis to Revelation, it's about family. God thinks in terms of multiplication. And so if things aren't multiplying in your life, if things aren't, you're not feeling, seeing things that you feel like you're working and you're putting all this effort in and things aren't multiplying, maybe it's because we've messed up the multiplier. You see, multiplication requires intimacy. In your marriage relationship, in your relationship with other people. And if we fail to have an intimacy with our spouse that is real, that is significant, we won't see multiplication take place in our family, in our lives, in our effectiveness, and what God wants to pour out through you on the earth. It requires us to be one. Why don't we stand to our feet this morning? Jesus prayed one prayer in John chapter 17. I wanna close with this verse. But he's, Jesus is praying to his heavenly Father. He says, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. That all of them, he says, may be one. My prayer for us this morning is that you in your marriage will be one with your spouse. Maybe up until this very moment, you have not been one. Maybe at one time you were one. Maybe at the past you were one. Maybe your oneness has gone on and off. But we need to be one. And then he says it again, Father, just as you and me and I and you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. What's he saying? He's saying if we're not one, the world won't believe anything that's coming out of my mouth. I've given them the glory that you gave me. And then he says it again, that there may be one, that they may be one as we are one. He says it a second time. I and them and you and me, he repeats it again a third time. That they may be brought to complete unity. And then he says this, then, and let me tell you something, church, and only then. Then, if we're one, if you're one in your relationship, if you and your spouse are one, the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. If you're not one in your relationship, if you're not one and you're not fighting to be one, then everything around you is operating in disproportionate, in disproportion to you. You have to be one. It has to be first place. Your marriage only works in first place. And this morning, if you're here and you're in a broken place, if you're here in a lonely place, if you're here in a place where you tried, you tried, you tried, and things didn't end up the way you had hoped it had ended up. Listen, I know it's cost you something. It always does. But that's what I love about our great Heavenly Father. Because the fact that you're alive and you're standing here today, the fact that you're listening into this, the fact that you might be watching this, the fact that there is blood coursing through your veins and air in your lungs means that you have the opportunity to stand up and now live this way going forward. 
as people in the kingdom of God, when God reveals something to us as sons and daughters of Jesus, we get to stand up in that place and then operate from that revelation while it transforms our life. That's what revelation is supposed to do. Revelation from God, if it doesn't lead to transformation, it will be, it will turn and do the opposite. You will then have a heart that turns to a heart of stone. Nobody wants that. But when we allow God to reveal something to us and we, trans, we allow it to transform, permeate, transform, and reform us, essentially, it will transform the way we live our lives. Everything will be different. And so I'm believing as we pray this morning for oneness in our marriages, but also for healing and revelation for those of us who might not be married or were married or are divorced or going through a hardship or believing for a spouse that's far from God or standing with someone else who is far from God or standing for a relationship that's been hurt and that's been trampled on. No matter where we are, if we force ourselves to live a love that is sacrificial, we know that true love always, always, always breaks down every stronghold. Amen? Father, I pray this morning that we would be one. Just as you and the Father are one, so that the world will know that you've sent us. You've sent my family on a mission. And so I declare over my family and every family that can hear my voice that we are one. Just say it in your own words real quick. We're one. I'm gonna start speaking faith. We're one. We're one. Not just word, but an action. We're one. We're one. In Jesus' name. Amen, 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 amen. Really quickly, I wanna pray for one more group of people this morning. For those of you who say, man, I don't know that I'm a son or daughter of, the, of, of God. I don't, I, just, I, 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 don't I, I feel far from God. I feel like um, if I was to leave this place, I don't feel like I'm in relationship with God. I wanna, I wanna know who Jesus is. I want my life to be running towards him. I want my eternity to be secured. I want to, you know, I want to follow Jesus. Pastor sung the song, you know, I've decided, I want to decide today to follow Jesus. I want to live this way. Something's exploding inside of my heart. And if that's you this morning, I want to say a prayer with you, whether you've said a prayer before to God, or this might be your very first time. I wanna encourage you that this is a significant moment for you and we're gonna pray together as a church right now. You say, you know what, Gabe? I'm ready to surrender my life to Jesus. I'm ready to surrender my heart to Jesus. I'm a believer in who Jesus is and I want Jesus to know that I want you to pray this prayer with me and everyone's gonna say it. Can we pray together? Let's pray together. Say, Jesus. Really mean it. Say, Jesus, I'm ready. Today I surrender. I believe that you live, that you died, that you rose again. Today, I surrender my life to you. Forgive me, Lord. I want to pursue all that you have for me. From this day forward, you have my life. In Jesus' name, amen.